Walk with me amidst the grandeur of an ancient city, and a cinematic tale unfolds. A narrative of power, decadence, and the notorious Emperor Nero. A time when the forum's pillars echoed with the whispers of empire, but beneath the facade lay the shadows of a ruler whose reign would become synonymous with excess and infamy. Close your eyes and relax. Allow me to transport you to an era where the corridors of the Imperial Palace concealed the malevolent deeds of a deranged sovereign. We may now begin. The Life of Nero Nero, originally named Lucius Domitius Ahenobarbus, was born on December 15th, AD 37, in Antium, near modern-day Anzio. He was the only child of Gnaeus Domitius Ahenobarbus, a politician, and Agrippina the Younger. Agrippina was the sister of the third Roman Emperor, Caligula. Additionally, Nero was the great-great-grandson of the former Emperor Augustus, being descended from Augustus's only daughter, Julia. Suetonius, the ancient biographer, critical of Nero's ancestors, reported that Emperor Augustus reproached Nero's grandfather for his excessive enjoyment of violent gladiator games. According to Jürgen Malitz, Suetonius mentioned that Nero's father was known for being irascible and brutal, and both father and son excessively enjoyed chariot races and theatre performances, behaviours that were deemed inappropriate for their noble status. Suetonius also noted that when congratulated on Nero's birth, Domitius, Nero's father, predicted that any child born to him and Agrippina would have a detestable nature and pose a public danger. Incredible Foresight Domitius died in AD 41, and a few years prior he was involved in a serious political scandal. As a consequence, Nero's mother and his two surviving sisters, Agrippina and Julia Livilla, were exiled to a remote Mediterranean island. Agrippina was said to have been exiled for plotting against Emperor Caligula. Nero's inheritance was confiscated, and he was sent to live with his paternal aunt, Domitia Lepida, who was the mother of Messalina, the third wife of the late Emperor Claudius. After the death of Caligula, Claudius ascended to the position of Emperor. Nero's mother, Agrippina, married Claudius in AD 49 and became his fourth wife. On the 25th of February, 50 AD, Claudius was pressured to adopt Nero as his son, resulting in Nero being given the new name, Nero Claudius Caesar Drusus Germanicus. To mark the adoption, Claudius had gold coins issued. According to classics professor 
Josiah Osgood. These coins, through their distribution and imagery, signaled the emergence of a new leader. However, David Schoter pointed out that, despite events in Rome, Nero's stepbrother Britannicus was more prominently featured in provincial coinages during the early fifties. Nero entered public life as an adult at the age of fourteen in AD 51. At sixteen, he married Claudia Octavia, Claudius's daughter and his own stepsister. Between AD 51 and 53, Nero delivered speeches advocating for various communities, including the Ilians, the Apamians, and the northern colony of Bologna, following a destructive fire. Claudius passed away in AD 54, and several ancient historians often assert that he was poisoned by Agrippina. One historian suggests that Claudius's death, often viewed as expedited by Agrippina, was influenced by signs indicating Claudius's renewed affection for his natural son. Josephus, however, presents the poisoning as a rumour. Various accounts differ in their details, with Tacitus implicating poison maker Locusta and servant Halotus, while Suetonius involves Halotus and Agrippina. Cassius Dio attributes the administration of poison to Agrippina instead of Halotus. The involvement of Agrippina in Claudius's death is a topic of debate among scholars to this day, and we will perhaps never really know the truth. Prior to Claudius's death, Agrippina orchestrated the removal of tutors for Claudius's sons, replacing them with individuals of her personal choosing. She also persuaded Claudius to replace two prefects of the Praetorian Guard, suspected of supporting Claudius's son with Afranius Burrus, who would later become Nero's mentor. By ensuring the loyalty of the Praetorian Guard through these strategic replacements, Agrippina paved the way for Nero to assume power smoothly after Claudius's death. The primary literary sources for Nero's reign in ancient Rome are Tacitus, Suetonius, and Cassius Dio. These historians criticized Nero's construction projects as excessively extravagant contending that their expenses depleted Italy through substantial financial contributions and left the provinces in ruin. However, modern scholars highlight the economic context of the deflation during that period, suggesting that Nero's investments in public works and charities were intended to alleviate economic difficulties. Nero assumed the role of emperor at age 16 in AD 54. Seneca, his tutor, crafted Nero's initial speech before the Senate, where Nero discussed his intent to eliminate the ills of the previous regime. In his speech, 
Nero pledged to follow the Augustan model, end secret trials within the palace, eradicate corruption among court favorites and freedmen, and respect the privileges of the Senate and individual senators. Nero's commitment to Senate autonomy, distinguishing him from predecessors Caligula and Claudius, was generally well received by the Roman Senate. Nero's mother, Agrippina, sought to control politics through her son. She removed rivals like Domitia Lepida the Younger, Marcus Junius Silanus, and Narcissus. Nero deviated from tradition by featuring Agrippina on coins instead of the emperor's portrait. Agrippina received special honors, including two lictors in public, a privilege for the magistrates only. In AD 55, Nero ousted Agrippina's ally Marcus Antonius Pallus from the treasury. Their relationship soured as Agrippina disapproved of Nero's cultural pursuits and his affair with Claudia Acte. After threatening to support Britannicus, he was poisoned and Agrippina was eventually exiled when Nero suspected her growing closeness to his wife Octavia. The evaluation of Nero's personal involvement in politics during the early years of his reign lacks clear evidence from ancient sources. Policies explicitly attributed to Nero during this period are described as well-meant but incompetent notions, such as his unsuccessful attempt to abolish all taxes in AD 58. Scholars generally attribute the administrative successes of these years to Nero's advisors, Burrus and Seneca. Malitz notes that, in later years, Nero panicked when faced with decisions during times of crisis. Despite uncertainties about Nero's personal role, his early administration received acclaim. A generation later, these years were retrospectively viewed as an exemplar of good and moderate government. Fiscal reforms, particularly those placing tax collectors under stricter control through the establishment of local offices to supervise their actions, were well received. After Lucius Pedanius Secundus affair, in which a desperate slave murdered his master, Nero allowed slaves to file complaints about their treatment to the authorities. Outside of Rome, Nero commissioned the construction of several villas or palaces, the ruins of which are still visible today. Some notable examples include the Villa of Nero at Antium, located near modern-day Anzio, the place of Nero's birth. He ordered the rebuilding of the villa on a grander scale, including the addition of a theatre. Villa at Subiaco in Lazio Nero had three artificial lakes constructed. The lakes featured waterfalls, bridges, and walkways, creating a luxurious setting. Villa of Nero at Olympia in Greece 
Nero stayed at his villa in Olympia, particularly during his participation in the Olympic Games in 67 AD. The villa served as his residence during the event. These constructions reflected Nero's penchant for grandeur and luxury, showcasing his desire for opulent living and an extravagant leisure. The circumstances surrounding the death of Nero's mother in AD 15 are complex and not fully understood. According to Tacitus, the conflict between Nero and Agrippina was triggered by Nero's affair with Poppaea Sabina. Tacitus suggests that the affair began while Poppaea was still married to Rufrius Crispinus, and later he mentions that Poppaea was married to Otho when the affair started. The conflicting details in Tacitus' works add some uncertainty to the timeline. In histories, Tacitus indicates that Agrippina opposed Nero's relationship with Poppaea due to her affection for Nero's wife Octavia. According to one account from Tacitus, Poppaea's challenge may have contributed to pushing Nero over the edge. However, modern historians note that Agrippina's death did not offer Poppaea much advantage, as Nero didn't even marry her until years later, 62 AD. Suetonius, another ancient historian, provides a different account, stating that Nero had a former freedman, Anictatus, arrange a shipwreck for Agrippina. Despite surviving the wreck and swimming ashore, Agrippina was subsequently executed by Anicetus, who reported her death as a suicide. The exact motivations and events leading to Agrippina's death remain a subject of historical debate, with different sources presenting varying perspectives on Nero's role and the circumstances surrounding the event. Modern scholars generally believe that Nero's reign was relatively stable and prosperous in the years preceding Agrippina's death. Nero's early administration, guided by advisors like Burrus and Seneca, received acclaim for fiscal reforms, administrative successes, and moderate governance. For example, Nero's exploration expedition to the Nile River sources was widely successful. After Agrippina's exile, Burrus and Seneca played key roles in the administration of the empire, doing much of the heavy lifting for Nero. However, Nero's behavior began to take a negative turn after his mother's death. Miriam Griffith suggests that Nero's decline may have begun with the murder of his stepbrother in Britannicus in AD 55. Nero's conduct became more egregious and he lost a sense of right and wrong, listening to flattery with total credulity. The removal of Agrippina seemed to have significant implications for Nero's behavior, according to Tacitus. Around AD 60, Nero initiated the construction of a new palace, the Domus Transitoria, which was intended to connect various imperial states on the Palatine, including the gardens of the Mycenaeus, Hortilamiani, 
and Hodi Loliani. In the year 62, Nero faced significant changes in his inner circle. His advisor, Burrus, died, marking a transition. Nero also initiated the first treason trial against Antistius Socianus, executed rivals like Cornelius Sulla and Rubellius Plautus, and took actions that marked a turning point in his relationship with the Roman Senate. Jürgen Mallet suggests that Nero, feeling less inclined to support the Senate, abandoned the restraint he had shown earlier, leading to a shift in his approach to governance. On the death of Burrus, Nero appointed two new Praetorian prefects, Phanius Rufus and Ophonius Tigellinus. Seneca, politically isolated, was forced to retire. According to Tacitus, Nero divorced Octavia on grounds of infertility and banished her. Octavia's exile led to public anger and protests, prompting Nero to accuse her of adultery with Anectetus ultimately leading to her execution. Now that's not very fair, isn't it? In AD 64, during the Saturnalia, Nero married Pythagoras, a freedman. The Great Fire of Rome the Great Fire of Rome began on the night of July 18 to 19 in the year 64. It likely originated in one of the merchant shops along the slope of the Aventine overlooking the Circus Maximus, or in the wooden outer seating of the Circus itself. Rome, prone to fires, faced a catastrophic event fueled by the night's strong winds. The fire, described by Tacitus, Cassius Dio, and modern archaeological records, caused extensive destruction to mansions, residences, public buildings, and temples on the Aventine, Palatine, and Caelian hills. The blaze persisted for over seven days, subsided briefly, and then reignited for three more days. It destroyed three of Rome's fourteen districts, and severely damaged seven more. Controversy surrounded the cause of the fire. Some believed it was accidental attributing it to the timber-framed merchant shops and the flammable goods they sold, as well as the wooden stands of the circus. Others claim it was arson, possibly orchestrated by Nero himself. Did the Emperor of Rome burn down his own city? Well, Pliny the Elder, Suetonius, and Cassius Dio provided various reasons for Nero's alleged involvement, such as creating a backdrop for the theatrical performance about the burning of Troy. Suetonius suggested that Nero started the fire to clear the site for his planned golden house an extravagant palace featuring artificial landscapes and a colossal statue of himself, which he named the Colossus of Nero. According to Suetonius and Cassius Dio, Nero even sang the Sack of Ilium in stage costume while the city burned. 
The notion that Nero played the fiddle while Rome burned is considered a literary construct of Flavian propaganda. It's probably not true, reflecting the disapproval of Nero's attempt to deviate from Augustan models of rule. Tacitus refrains from definitively assigning responsibility to Nero for the Great Fire, noting that Nero was in Antium when it began, and returned to Rome to organize relief efforts. Nero used his own funds to cover expenses related to removing bodies and debris. After the fire, he opened palaces to provide shelter for the displaced and arrange food supplies for those who were suffering from starvation. To deflect suspicion from himself, Tacitus claims that Nero blamed Christians for starting the fire. Many Christians were then arrested and subjected to brutal executions including being thrown to wild beasts, crucified, and burned alive. Tacitus suggests that Nero's motivation for such harsh punishments was not a sense of justice, but rather just because he enjoyed being cruel to people. In the aftermath of the fire, Nero initiated rebuilding efforts, with houses constructed in brick, spaced out, and facing porticos on wide roads. He also built a new palace complex known as the Domus Aurea, in the area that was cleared by the fire. However, the costs of this reconstruction were very exorbitant, leading to increased taxation, particularly on the provinces of the empire. To partially cover the expenses, Nero devalued the Roman currency, resulting in inflationary pressure. A notable development in the empire's economic history. To think that 2,000 years ago, People were complaining about inflation, just as we are here today in 2024. That's history for you. In AD 65, a conspiracy against Nero was organized by Gaius Calpurnius Piso, assisted by Subrius Flavus and Sulpicius Asper, a tribune and a centurion of the Praetorian Guard. Many conspirators aimed to rescue the state from Nero and restore the Republic. The plot was uncovered when the freedman Militus reported it to Nero's secretary, Epaphroditus. The conspiracy then failed, leading to the execution of its members, including the poet Lucan. Nero's former advisor, Seneca, was accused by Natalis, though he denied the charges. He was still ordered to commit suicide, as Nero just did not like him anymore. In the same year, it is reported that Nero kicked Poppaea to death before she could give birth to their second child. Modern historians question the accuracy of this account, suggesting that Poppaea might have died due to a miscarriage or childbirth. Nero mourned deeply for Poppaea and arranged an extravagant state funeral for her, promising a temple for her cult. Her body was embalmed and entombed, departing from customary cremation which was the style at the time. In AD 67, Nero married Sporus, a young boy who resembled Poppaea. 
Nero had Sporus castrated and married him with full ceremonial rites, including a dowry and a bridal veil. <laughs> Excuse me. Sorry, sometimes you have to laugh, don't you? Some believe that Nero did this out of regret for his actions towards Pompeo. In March 68, Gaius Julius Vindex, the governor of Gallia Lugdunensis, rebelled against Nero's tax policies. Lucius Virginius Rufus, the governor of Germania Superior, was ordered to suppress Vindex's rebellion. Vindex sought support from Servilius Supius Galba, the governor of Hispania, urging him to declare himself emperor in opposition to Nero. At the Battle of Vesontio in May 68, Virginius' forces defeated Vindex, who then committed suicide. However, after the victory, Virginius' legions sought to proclaim their commander as emperor. Despite Virginius' refusal to act against Nero, discontent in the legions of Germania and Galba's opposition in Hispania grew ever larger. While Nero initially had some control over the situation, support for Galba increased, and he was declared a public enemy. Gaius Nymphidius Sabinus, the prefect of the Praetorian Guard, also abandoned his allegiance to Nero and supported Galba. In response, Nero fled Rome with the intention of reading the, reaching rather, the port of Ostia and then taking a fleet to one of the still loyal eastern provinces. According to Suetonius, Nero considered various options, including fleeing to Parthia, throwing himself upon the mercy of Galba, or simply appealing to the people. He even drafted a speech asking for forgiveness and offering to govern the prefecture of Egypt, but he did not deliver it out of fear of being attacked before he even reached the forum. After returning to Rome, Nero found the palace guard had left him and his calls to friends went unanswered. Feeling abandoned, he contemplated suicide and even ran out as if to throw himself into the Tiber. However, he returned and sought refuge in a villa offered by an imperial freedman named Phaon, located outside of the city. Nero, accompanied by four loyal freedmen, reached the villa in disguise. At the villa, Nero ordered a grave to be dug for him upon learning that the Senate had declared him a public enemy. Initially preparing to put himself in the grave, he paced back and forth muttering, Coalis Artifex Pereo. Translated to the English, I believe it means, What an artist the world is losing. Unable to take his own life, he asked one of his companions to set an example by killing him first. When the sound of approaching horsemen was heard, Nero knew that his fate was inevitable. Still, he was unable to perform the act. He forced his private secretary, Epaphrodotus, to take his life. Despite attempts to stop the bleeding, Nero's life could not be saved. 
His last words were reported as, Too late, this is fidelity. He died on the 9th of June, year 68, on the anniversary of his first wife Claudia Octavia's death, and he was buried in the mausoleum of the Domitii Ahenobarbi, now part of the Villa Borghese area in Rome. The circumstances surrounding Nero's death still do remain a little unclear, with conflicting accounts about whether he took his own life or was killed. With his death, the Julio-Claudian dynasty came to an end, leading to a period of chaos known as the Year of the Four Emperors. After Nero's death, the reactions to his demise were varied among different groups in Rome. According to Suetonius and Cassius Dio, the common people were very pleased with his death and began celebrating, while Tacitus betrayed a more complex scenario. Senators, nobility, and the upper class welcomed Nero's death, but the lower class, slaves, arena and theatre enthusiasts, and those who benefited from Nero's excesses were understandably upset about the whole ordeal. The military had mixed feelings, torn between loyalty to Nero and bribes to overthrow him. In the eastern provinces, such as Hellas, Nero's death was mourned, with some praising his supposed restoration of liberties with wisdom and moderation. Some scholars suggest that the Senate and wealthier individuals were relieved at Nero's demise, but the general populace remained a little nostalgic about it, and some even quite loyal. Nero's name was erased from some monuments, and portraits were reworked to represent other figures as part of a practice known as Danmatio Memoriae. The year of the four emperors that followed Nero's death brought further instability. Emperors could no longer rely on the perceived legitimacy of the imperial bloodline contributing to the civil war. Galba, Otho, and Vitellius each took turns as emperor during this turbulent period, with varying attitudes toward Nero. Otho, who overthrew Galba, was liked to by many soldiers for his association with Nero, and he still used Nero as a surname re-erecting statues to Nero in the years following. Vitellius began his reign with a grand funeral for Nero, including songs that were written by Nero himself. Finally, the legend of Nero's return, known as the Nero Redivivus legend, persisted for centuries after his death. Multiple impostors claiming to be Nero emerged, leading rebellions. The first appeared during the reign of Vitellius, another during the reign of Titus, and a third, supported by the Parthians, emerged during the reign of Domitian, almost leading to a war. The legend endured, with Augustine of Hippo referencing it as a popular belief in AD 422. Much like the later Charlemagne, perhaps Nero will also rise up again from the grave, when the time is right and convenient for him. Well, 
I hope that you've had an enlightening experience learning about Emperor Nero today. It's been interesting. That's one word for it. Much like his predecessor Caligula, he was one of those Roman emperors who went a little bit off the rails. But I promise you that I will never go off the rails and continue to provide you with sensible coverage about these insane figures from the past. Thank you once again for joining me. The channel is growing, and I'm very pleased to see it. I'm the ASMR Historian. I'll see you next time. Good night, everybody.